Hi everyone, welcome to the All Inclusive podcast, where each week I chat with industry experts and diversity, equity and inclusion executives from the world's leading global brands who share their knowledge, experience and actionable takeaways to help inclusive employers create cultures of belonging where everyone can thrive. Today, I'm joined by Christian Ragland, Director of Talent Acquisition and Diversity, Equity, Inclusion at Atlanticare. Hi, Christian. Natasha, how you doing? Thank you for having me. No, thanks for joining me. Um, So I think, why don't we kick off by telling our listeners a little bit more about yourself and your journey to where you are today? Sure, sure. So again, my name is Christian Ragland, and I am from South New Jersey, in the state of New Jersey from the United States. And uh, I born and raised in New Jersey, ended up matriculating into Penn State University to get my degree in political science. And I thought I was going to law school, was accepted into law school. And right at the time, I think it was 2011 when I graduated. Yeah, it was. I graduated and I was going to law school. And my mentor had said, Christian, you may want to go to law school. Maybe you want to go and get your master's degree because, you know, in 2011, we had what we call a little bit of a recession. And so many people were going back to college to avoid paying student loans. And what was happening were that you had a lot of people who went back to graduate school, law school, and graduated where they had more work experience than people like myself at the time. And so my mentor said, well, how about you try this? Go get your master's degree and start working. And I'll never forget, I got, I was getting my master's degree and I get a call from a company saying, hey, do you like talking to people? And I said, yeah, I like talking to people. And he said, perfect, you'll be great in human resources. And that's how I kicked off my journey in human <laughs> resources and recruitment. But you know, a little bit more detail about me, I, as I mentioned, I graduated from Penn State University, but you know, I was elected student body president of Penn State University, one of the first African-Americans to do it, which is not really the, the story, but really what I, I'm very proud of is that I've been able to be inclusive Uh, learn how to deal effectively with different people. And also, you know, I think if you look at where I am today in HR and diversity, equity, inclusion, it really relegates to my upbringing. And, you know, I had an aunt, you know, I call her famous and, and she has since passed away, but she was known for feeding the homeless of Atlantic City, New Jersey. And so Atlantic City gets a lot of notoriety, America's playground, you know, the beach, the boardwalk, the casinos, but you also had a very big homeless population. And she spent her life feeding people every day. And so I joke that my punishment, even though that's probably not the correct word, but my punishment as a kid was to go to Aunt Jean's soup kitchen. And it was there when I realized that poverty, homelessness knew no race. Everyone could be hit by poverty and homelessness and hunger. And it was there when I realized that I wanted to do something impactful for people, for everyone, for humanity. And so you fast forward to where I am now as a person who is a leader in human resources and recruitment and talent acquisition, as well as diversity, equity, inclusion. I'm taking those same very core principles that I learned as a child, how to make sure people have equitable access, make sure people feel welcomed and included. And number one, they feel valued for their diversity so that we can work together as we have more strength in our diversity. So that's a long winded way to say that I'm very passionate about this work and how it starts. Oh, fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing that, Christian. And I'm sorry to hear about your your aunt. Um, she sounds like an amazing lady. And yeah. it's great that she was able to help so many people that were mm-hmm. struggling and yes. provide an inspiration for you to do the great work that you're doing now. Um, I just want to go on a little bit more about and touch on a little bit deeper into kind of why you're doing DEI. Because you spoke about, as you said, your 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 aunt who who inspired you, but mm-hmm. Why for you are you really doing it? I'm willing to bet on my voice, I think. And I know that sounds very awkward, but I think we have many DEI practitioners today who I don't doubt their passion and their expertise, but sometimes they don't have the appropriate voice to bring people together. Sometimes it's divisive. And my whole life, I've been 
very much engaged in how to bring people together, right? You know, Dr. King says something profound and that, you know, a good leader is a molder of consensus and that that's what I desire to do my whole life. I've been, I never wanted to be in one area where I was the only black kid. I wanted to be around different people. And so now that we've alluded to this great scheme of diversity, equity, and inclusion, why I do it, because I really trust my voice to be able to bring and bridge the gap of differences so that we don't spend our time trying to identify what makes us different, but we find ways to include our differences to create you know, what I like to call the Power Ranger model of bringing all of those different Power Rangers together to create the bigger mechanism that's able to take out bigger enemies, right? And so I'm very passionate about how do I take what we consider diverse included to create fair, equitable access. I mean, it's all about using your voice. Um, that's what I'm doing today with the podcast. And I want to be able to give people like yourself the platform to be able to share your knowledge and experience. So um I, th- I think it's great. How is the work you're doing in DEI enhancing Atlantic Air? Yeah. So one of the things, let's start here, right? What we know is that Indeed.com and maybe Deloitte and some of these other consulting firms will tell you that today's workforce, particularly 80% of today's workforce, wants to work for an organization, a company that values DEI. Simple mm-hmm. as that. So, which means is that it's not enough for just companies to put their job posting online and say, apply to our job. What are you doing from the DEI standpoint that's going to make this person feel welcome and comfortable to be their authentic self? And so, the work that we're doing, number one at Atlantic Care, was we had to add a core value, and that core value was inclusion. And so, we had five values before. But we had to add one that was really geared towards us creating this welcoming experience for people. Why is that important? Well, because we also know that people give better effort when they feel valued. I think there's a number out there. I think 57% more effort is given when someone feels valued. And that makes total sense, especially from an HR standpoint, right, where we know the people who literally do their eight hours and go home, they don't want to do anything else. They don't want to be bothered. They don't want to do anything that puts them out of their time limit. But when you feel value, you go above and beyond. You're willing to do extra. And it's not about being valued so you can get more out of somebody. But you want people to feel comfortable, feel that they can be their authentic self. They don't have to mask who they are. They don't have to pretend to be somebody that they're not. But if we can't capture that at the door, we won't have a workforce that's stable. We'll always have turnover. We'll have people who are disgruntled. We'll have people who are constantly looking for different jobs. And so at Atlantic Air, what we've done is we created that core value of inclusion. We've implemented inclusive leadership training for all of our leaders. We've added more employee resource groups. We put budgets behind our DEI work. We are in the community connecting the dots for our patients and creating health equitable outcomes, making sure that no one can say that we did not see or do anything to help them as it pertains to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so we're continuing to grow, right? But again, right now, our goal is just like many organizations is to get this going where it's embedded in your culture at particularly Atlantic Air. But, you know, I think many of us remember 2020, George Floyd's death. And so that was the spark plug that really made many organizations look at their DE&I strategy. And so I think two years later, if you want to look at that as a benchmark, I believe Atlantic has done so many things to not only embed the inclusive culture, but to create an environment where people can truly be their authentic self and not be ashamed of who they are. And what we realize is when we have more differences, we have better strength. So there's really great things that we're doing on the uh, external internal side of Atlantic Care. Of course, we are operationalizing some things, including you know, inclusive leadership competencies for all leaders, making sure that we know that leaders know where they stand as an inclusive leader, but also making sure that we are holding value to the fact that inclusion is our core value and that we live that, we breathe that, and we want people to know that that's something that's going to take us to success. And that's one of the things that I really, truly believe in is that strength lies in differences, um, not necessarily in similarities. And I think that it's, it is a, it's, it's definitely a core driving force um, and it should be within an organization. Um, and you've touched on the competencies that, that you embed in, in the roles with your leaders regarding where they sit as an inclusive leader. Um, I'm interested to, to hear from you. How was that kind of onboarding regarding yeah. that? How did that go down? Well, this is actually, we just started it literally two months ago. And I think, uh, which was exciting, you know, because 
we spent a considerable amount of time talking about what inclusive leadership is. We spent a considerable amount of time, a year in fact, having our leaders go through training, having our leaders spend time with me on micro lessons on different things around inclusion. And, you know, the blind spots that we may have as leaders where, you know, your perception may be someone's reality or it may not be their reality, right? And so we want to make sure that we are not overcompensating for biases that just happen to be there and that turn into microaggressions. And so we did a lot of work around explaining those things. So now that we gave our leaders education, now we have to hold them accountable to Hey, are you an inclusive leader? What does your inclusive leadership style look like? When someone says that they can't do something, do you insult them? Do you consider them lazy or do you find resources for them? Or do you try to identify their strengths? Do you try to identify ways you can help them? You know, and so this inclusive leadership competency is gonna be very important for us as we establish baselines around what a inclusive leader should look like, sound like, and be like, so that we're not harboring people who don't desire to be inclusive. Because if you have uninclusive leaders or inclusive leaders, we know our workforce is gonna suffer. And we know if you do engagement surveys, if you go out and ask questions and polls about, how do you feel about your workspace? Those things will come out. And today in the world of social media and the world of access to information, you don't want to be on the wrong side or the wrong side of receiving end of someone talking negative about your environment and your culture. You know, one of my favorite speakers, Kendall Wright, says, you know, something to the effect of, you know, culture can eat competence for breakfast. And, you know, this is why you need to make sure your culture is right where it needs to be. So you don't have competent people who are not able to do their job effectively because they have not addressed a culture that's making it hard for them. That's so interesting. Thanks. Thanks so much for sharing that, Christian. Um, because I think embedding it in the competency is is definitely going to be a way for you to measure where you're mm-hmm. at. And and if you've got leaders that are hitting those benchmarks for you, then you know that you've you, you're doing something right or you're on the right tracks to building the culture that, that you're wanting and building that inclusive culture. Um, so that's great to hear that that's something that you've implemented. And I'm, I'm interested to see how, how that pans out. I, I wish you all the best of that. Um, Absolutely. How do you think health organizations can effectively increase diversity in the workplace? Because I know we've touched on it a few little bits um, just, just, just now, but overall, what do you think is, is a few things that they can really effectively do? Absolutely. So two things right off the bat. Number one, and this is a great partnership between HR and DEI leaders, identify what your hard to fill jobs are. If it's a respiratory therapist, if it's a nurse, if it's an x-ray tech, if it's a paramedic, identify these jobs, the good paying jobs, and then go into the communities that have diversity and send them back to school for those jobs and allow them to work while they're doing it. This is something we're doing right now where we have implemented what we call education investment program, where we will send individuals back to school at 100% paid for for any of those jobs. And what we do is we hire them in entry level roles while they're in school. And so all they have to do is work for us while they're in school. And then when they graduate, they just go back into, they go into the role that they're going to school for, whether a respiratory therapist, a nurse, a doctor, they're getting more, uh, of course, you know, better income. And now we're keeping them in their community and they look and reflect the community that we're servicing. You know, at Atlantic Care, we're fortunate that our healthcare system touches urban, rural, and suburban within a 10 mile radius. And so we are able to make sure that we are touching the full gamut, the full spectrum of people in our communities. But if you wanna figure out how to diversify your workforce, you have to go and build the workforce from the communities that reflect your patients. The other thing that, you know, we do as well is that you, it goes back to what I said before. You have to extend yourself as an organization that you are someone who desires to be inclusive. Like I mentioned before, if 80% of today's workforce is saying when they go and apply, I wonder where they stand on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I had a friend. He was interviewing for a, a top job at a hospital and is a clinical job. And the first question that he asked the senior leader was not about anything clinical. It wasn't about compensation. He wanted to know where they stood on diversity, equity, and inclusion, because I may have the resume that you're looking for, but am I going to be comfortable? And it doesn't mean just race and ethnicity. It doesn't mean just LGBTQ plus. It's not just veteran status. It's, can I be me? 
Can I be myself authentically? And if I can't, it's okay. Just let me know so I don't waste my time. And mm. we have to create a culture where people can be their authentic selves at every point of the day. The other thing that we've done to diversify the workforce, which I'm really proud of because we just completed it yesterday, is what we call a high school hiring list. And so we went to our diverse high schools and we did the exact same thing. We hired them before they graduated high school and they're going into entry-level roles. And they once they graduate high school in, I think, three weeks, they start working in the hospital and then they go back to school. In those three high schools that we partnered with was amazing diversity amazing diversity. And the best part was when they went home and said, mom, dad, you know, grandma, grandpa, whoever, I got a job at Atlantic Care. Their family said, well, how can I get a job at Atlantic Care? And so now we got access to more people who want to apply, right? And so it's this ripple effect of how do I touch one person that leads it to the other? I think also you, there's some other practical things that you can do, which, um, you know, I'm really excited about. So in, in the United States, right, we have what we call historically black colleges and university, right? I, you know, we have the first historically black college and university, Cheney University in Pennsylvania, which is about maybe an hour away from here. But just for history's sake, the reason why we have historically black colleges and universities in the United States of America is because a hundred and so years ago, black people could not go to all white institutions. And so we had to create our own institutions and those institutions are still standing. With that being said, Atlantic Care has partnered with these HBCUs to capture those graduating seniors who are coming out with career fields that correlate to healthcare and we're building pipelines for them. We're building journeys for them, pathways for them. You know, continuing to work with community partners around the differently able, right? We have an organization, a few organizations that deal with those with mental, um, uh, disabilities or they're differently able on the mental capacity side or people who are, you know, in wheelchairs or things like that. And we've changed our language from saying disability to being differently able so that no one feels that they are less than someone else. Uh, but continue to partner with community organizations. We do a lot of work with re recovery, right? You know, we have a lot of people who are suffering in silence with addictions. And sometimes they feel stigma keeps them from having jobs. So we partner with our local court systems and we call, we're called a recovery employer, which means we will take anyone who's in recovery as long as they have gone through the system correctly and we will work with them to find a job. And so that's how you create an inclusive workspace where everyone can be themselves while getting the help that they need while working for one accord of health equity, which is fair access for all. Oh, that's fantastic. That's great. That's great to hear Christian. Um, what is one of the projects, if you've not already touched on it uh, already, because um, there was a, quite a few there that you felt that you guys were, were doing and that all other organizations can do, but what's one project you're working on now that you're most excited about? You know, I, I think the culmination between workforce development and DE9 is the bigger project, but I think overall it's our leadership development. I think one of the areas that many organizations don't really have strategic initiatives around is how do you develop leaders, diverse leaders? How do you develop diverse leaders that reflect the community that you serve, right? And so many organizations, you won't see a lot of diversity at the top, particularly because there just may not be a lot of people interested in those roles. But I think we, we created a project called the Diverse Leadership Readiness Program. And it's a pilot program that we just kicked off a couple of months ago where we are taking five diverse leaders and they're going through senior leadership classes. They're going through uh, one-on-ones with our CEO. They're sitting with vice presidents and we're giving them all the tools, all the case studies, all the social opportunities to network so that they're developing all of these things for a senior leader role one day. But I think as we look at that, that's going to be extremely important that we continue to build on because as the world becomes more diverse, as our communities become more diverse, people are going to look at your leadership structure and say, let me see what it looks like at the top so I know that I am in a place that I have opportunity to grow. So I think Diverse Leadership Readiness Program is another initiative. I also want to highlight our cultural competency. You know, something that we're spending a lot of time on is creating tools and systems that allow our clinicians and our providers to have all the access that they need to take care of a diverse patient. You know, it is no secret that you cannot choose your patient in the hospital. We cannot say, I want this patient today. It's whatever comes through the door that day. And so you can't control if this person 
is from a different country. You can't control if this person is LGBTQ+. You can't control if this person has uh, is differently abled. You can't control if this person is a U.S. veteran. All of these different things make up the core value of diversity, but cultural competency is your ability to communicate with difference. And you can't avoid difference because you don't feel comfortable, you don't feel knowledgeable. You have to be prepared to be inclusive and create an equitable environment. You know, I share this analogy all the time. Um, so I love suits. Um, you probably can't see all of this suit, but you know, it's a nice suit if you take my word for no, it. No, it looks great. No, I can, <laughs> from just seeing the top, is it, and you've got the matching trousers. I can just picture yes. the whole yep. thing. I can picture it yes. all. It's, it no. looks great. I appreciate that, you know. And, uh, you know, my wife dressed me really nice. This morning. No, I'm just joking. So, <laughs> I love suits. And, you know, in the social media age, when you have a nice outfit, when you have a fire outfit, the first thing you do is you say, you know what, I'm going to put this on social media. Now, many of you may remember being in grade school where you had a pencil sharpener and you had to go up and try. See, that was the time for you to show off your outfit. So when I was in grade school, I would take random trips to the pencil sharpener so everyone could see my new velour suit or my new jean jacket, right? So yeah, anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, I had this suit on one day. I had bought it from Niagara Falls and I was really excited about it. And I was at work and I was like, man, I can't wait for people to see this suit, right? And so then I get home. I said, you know what? I'm going to post this color, this suit on Facebook. I'm going to put some vague quote like we always do. It has nothing to do with the outfit, but I just want you to say that you like my suit. So anyway, I post a picture and many people say nice suit until one person comments and says, I wish I could see your suit, but I'm blind. And I had a moment of reflection where I said, I can either ignore this comment and act like I didn't see it, or I have to find a way to make this person feel that just you are, that person may be blind, but it does not exclude them from the, the experience. And so what I did was I channeled my greatest eighth grade English skills and I began to write about what I was wearing in such detailed fashion that the individual on the other side said, I can picture what you are saying by your words. And thank you for taking time out to help me understand because some people don't um, care. They don't care. They just say it's uncomfortable. I don't, you know, it's nothing I can do. And so I say that to say cultural competency is about how do you effectively communicate with different people? How are you able to make them feel comfortable and not feel that they have to stand out? And so a lot of work being done around cultural competency is good that we're doing. And we created a project where we have a free tool that every employee has access to through some partners outside of the country that created this tool. And, you know, we make sure that our leaders use it and our staff use it so that no one feels that they don't know anything. So a, a lot of work around diverse leadership, readiness and cultural competencies on the horizon. Oh, fantastic. So I'm interested to know if you faced any challenges. Really quite naturally when you Everyone in the DEI space can say they have because you're dealing with people who may have never understood the value or the importance of DEI. Um, you're people who may say, "Are we doing this just to check a box?" And I think that's the difficulty that I've experienced is the genuine nature of people really believing that this is important work. But like I always tell people, DEI is directly correlated to your bottom line. It's directly correlated to your profitability. And if people don't like you because you're not inclusive, the money is not coming. If people don't like you because they, you're not diverse, money is not coming. People will say things like, I'm not going to that hospital because of how they treat me or how they treated so-and-so. And so this is why I believe many organizations scoured the area uh, after George Floyd to find people who could talk about DEI because they recognize that in the age of, I'm going to use a term here that I don't necessarily agree with, but cancel culture, right? Where if you're not doing things up to par the way they want you to do it, they will find things or find people to speak out against you. And so, you know, with that being said, we had to really journey with our leaders and our staff about, we're not doing this because this is the right thing to do on paper, on Facebook, on social media. It's not a, it's not a cool hashtag. This is about people's way of lives. This is humanitarian, you know? And on top of that, in healthcare, we also know that people heal better when they feel inclusive. People feel better when they know their care is being taken care of by people that genuinely care about their own well-being. And so, you know, I think the challenges that we, we faced in the beginning were natural challenges of explaining and educating. But I will say back to my voice, back to why I'm in DEI, and i I was willing to bet on my voice that I can have these conversations with people who may never have had a conversation about DEI and i before. You know, freshman year at Penn State uh, at, in college, my roommate who was white, 
Uh, he and I grew up in different backgrounds. He lived in a part of Pennsylvania that probably had no black people. I grew up in a diverse area, but we are, you know, from day one, we clicked. We're good friends to this day, but we had a moment where I almost got into a fist fight with him about something very funny. So um, I don't know. So I'm going to ask you, well, what do you call your noodles that come in a cup in London? Or in oh, England? like pop noodles. Okay. We what do call you call it like them? Pot, pot, pot noodle. So sorry, okay. it's my accent. So pot, oh, no. yeah, pot okay. noodles. Have you ever heard of ramen noodles before? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. So in America, I don't know. It, it's it's not necessarily. Because that's like, in the bowl, oh, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So got that. There are people who call it ramen, right? Oh, okay. I grew up calling it oodles of noodles. <laughs> and that, I don't know where that came from, but that's where I grew up calling it. But it's the same thing. And so one day, my friend, my roommate, Mike, says, hey, you're going to eat your ramen? And I'm like, what's he talking about, right? What is he talking about? And I'm like, oh, my oodles of noodles. And he looked at me like, don't ever say that again. You're a grown man. Don't say oodles of noodles ever again. And looked at me and said that in a way that I said, oh, we're talking about the same thing, but we call it something different. And many people don't realize that you're talking about the same thing, but you call it something different, but you only look at or look around the difference and not the similarities. And this is where we miss our opportunity for cultural competence. We miss our opportunity to engage and we miss our opportunity to really tactfully work on our curiosity. So um, I'm just really passionate about making sure that people don't feel that their lack of education is because of their inability to be curious or learn something new. Thank you so much for joining us for me today and sharing um, all your great nuggets with our listeners. Um, Just before you go, what is your parting piece of advice that you'd give the DEI leaders of tomorrow? Um, Stay authentic, but stay curious. And you know that DEI is always evolving. There are new things we're learning each day, but find a way to keep your authenticity involved in the DEI because we already have enough people who are world proclaimed DEI speakers. They can run history down like there's nothing. But what I think will separate a good DEI leader is when they see your charismatic personality, your ability to connect with people and your ability to say, yes, I may agree with this or you may not agree with this, but we can still get along. I think we need more of that. I think we need more people saying it's okay to, for me not to know this, but I'm willing to learn. But if we do it from a hostile standpoint, if we do it from a, a place of hostility, that's when we lose people and we lose our allies. You know, I heard, um, <laughs> you know, I know I'm not, DEI is not all about race. It's not. And I want to make sure I say that clear, but I was at a NAACP a breakfast a couple of weeks ago and uh, one of the speaker, the keynote speaker said something I thought was so funny. He said to black people, he said, don't be so black that you don't have no white friends. And I thought that was so profound. No, that is so true. It is, but, honestly. It, I yeah. thought that was so profound because mm. we do this sometimes as people. And we yeah. do this not just Black people, but in our comfortable spaces. We are so what we're comfortable as that we deflect people who are not like us, who can help us. Yeah. And so that's my word of advice. Is, listen, don't be so whatever that you that you push away the very people that can help you that just mm. because they don't look like you. Thanks again, Christian. And just before you leave as well, how can people connect with you? Oh, they can reach me um, a couple of ways. If you want to reach me by LinkedIn, it's Christian uh, Raglan at LinkedIn, Christian D. Raglan LinkedIn. And if you want to reach me via Facebook, it's Christian Dupree Raglan. If you want to reach me by email, I got an easy email for you, diversity at atlanticare.org. And so oh, that is my company. That's a good email. email. So, yeah, it is. I love it. And so um, I, I'm, I'm always grateful for people to connect and all of these great things. And so I appreciate this time that Tasha allowed me to be here. I wish I could have been in England because that probably would have been a better landscape for me. But <laughs> one day. Do you know what? It's not all it's cracked up to be. But <laughs> you know, today was a bit of on the, on the cloudy side. Okay. So I don't, I don't think you probably would want to be. <laughs> it's a bit of a cloudy <laughs> one. But when the sun's out, yeah, for sure, definitely come down. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much again. No, thanks again. And I'll speak to you soon.